there's a general editorial instinct to want to downplay calling things bad things. So we saw this with NPR, um, who is the worst at this because they're so obsessed with not looking like they're the liberal media. They had on their spokesperson to explain why – on Morning Edition to explain why they never call Trump's lies lies or refer to Trump as a liar. Uh, she said that she went to go look at the definition of Oxford English Dictionary – to seek the definition of lie, which she said was, quote, a false statement made with intent to deceive. And then she went on to say, quote, intent being the key word there without the ability to <laughs> peer into John Donald Trump's head. I can't tell you what his intent was. Right. I can tell you what he said and how that it squares or doesn't square with facts. Now, by this standard, of course, you could never call anyone right, a liar. Right. Without knowing what their intention is, which means that actually, actually the only way you could like be a liar is if you call yourself a liar because you knowingly lied. Right. Lots of terms in the English language involve theory of mind. They involve mens rea of some kind, right? You're, you're assuming a degree of ill intent by using what, you know, normal human beings do, which is pattern recognition, which is after the hundredth time Trump has been corrected on something or the thousandth time he's lied and he kind of winks and nods at the camera that knowing he's lying – and sort of even will tell you he's lying that like, I think we're in the safe spot now where we can call it a lie. But because of this civility fetish, because there are people in the media who can't look like they're partisan or they're overreaching or to God forbid the I word ideological, we routinely come to these terms and these labels that are on their face deeply inadequate to describe the forces that are, that have emerged on the right, which is an ideology manifested by Trump, but not limited to him that is increasingly able to take this fetish, to take this fear and to use it to their advantage, um, just as they have with you know, free speech absolutism, which you know, obviously Richard Spencer just admitted was a wedge to create space for Nazi ideology. They've taken the civility fetish and completely dunked on liberals and Democrats whose only recourse is more fact-checking and more sir, sir, sirism. Yeah, the, it seems like the idea that agreeing to disagree is basically the the highest order of partisan politics for the media and also for a lot of politicians. As if basically all of this is just like a matter of of rhetorical flourish or like witty repartee instead of politics having like actually very real implications for the people who live and die under the rather uncivil bombs that are dropped on them and the very uncivil threats that are made about overthrowing countries and, and uncivil policies that encourage families to be like torn apart from each other or land to be destroyed by extractive policies. These are real things that are not civil, but as long as you kind of don't use bad words and don't call names, then basically it's deemed to be totally reasonable regardless of the actual implications of this stuff. We saw this most, I, I think the Twitter terms of service is a really great distillation of this concept, yeah. which is to say decency and civility appeals are almost always about protecting people in power because the oppression, subjugation, and condescension of and abuse of those out of power is simply factored into the equation. And I thought a really yeah. uh, fascinating example of this was, so Twitter updated their terms of service last year, and this is their terms of service for, for violence. Calls for violence, right? It, yeah, this is calls for violence, which are a violation of the terms of service for Twitter. But they said, quote, Groups included in this policy will be those that identify as such or engage in activity both on and off the platform that promotes violence. This policy does not apply to military or government entities. So Twitter's terms of service specifically has a carve out yeah. for people in power. So you can post something saying – and this has obviously happened several times – we need to bomb Iran or we need to uh, shoot protesters in Palestine or we need to uh, have regime change in North Korea or we need to have a coup in Venezuela, that that is acceptable right. forms of provocation. Those are all completely civil discourse. Right. But telling, you know, Jeff Bezos or Donald Trump to go, you know, sit on a on a bicycle without a seat, that that's promotion of violence. Now, of course, in the former uh, example, my words are far more likely to actually affect violence, which is to say a high status person advocating op-ed in the Washington Post, cool regime change, that in the aggregate, that is far more actual material effect yeah. than, you know, someone telling the president to go fuck himself or someone telling a high status journalist that that they should be removed from society or some sort of delete your existence or some sort of right. thing that's gotten people suspended. Now, without focusing too much on Twitter, I do I do think that that, that asymmetry 
and the sort of complete formal codification of the protection of power as a way of policing, you know, civility or, or norms is a really finite and sort of, I think, unequivocal example of how these concepts are meant to indemnify power. They're meant to protect power. Right. Um, and another example of this was was a piece written in The Atlantic in uh, August of last year. It was a 12,000 word sort of magnum opus by a writer named Kurt Anderson about the the descent of America into conspiracy theory, that there was this radical fringe on both the right and the left that had ruined the country. Now, it's worth noting that the biggest conspiracy theory of our generation, you're, you and my generation, is the idea that Iraq helped do 9-11, right. which of course fits the, which, which fits the textbook definition of conspiracy, cherry-picked evidence, paranoia. Right, right. Literal collusion between yeah. these like evil entities conspiring together Without against, evidence, the, against um, the, the noble United States and its people. Right. So this is a textbook definition of a conspiracy theory. Turns out not to be true as, as most conspiracy theories definitionally don't. This was omitted from his 12,000 word official history. And of course, the reason why it was is the person who edits him, the managing editor, the head of The Atlantic, Jeffrey Goldberg, was the number one promoter of this conspiracy theory. <laughs> right. Whoops. Uh, now, and then he says over and over again in the, in the piece that he uses these ableist and kind of tautological labels, crazy, insane, delusional, to speak about what he calls postmodern leftists, the anti-war left. He, he claims falsely that the uh, Weather Underground set off, quote, thousands of bombs in the early 70s. The total number of bombs that were set up by all terrorist groups in the United States was 400, right, uh, 540. Right. But the point is to sort of say, oh, there's these loony crazies who sort of gone too far. Yeah. And what what's never really reconciled is that through this time period, one is this raises the question of, was it considered crazy or insane or delusional to kill 3 million Indo-Chinese in Vietnam? Was the CIA's use of you know torture and, and coups and dirty wars and executions, are these things considered crazy? And of course, the answer is no, because they're sort of factored in, that violence is factored into the system and that the only people who can be uncivil or be conspiracy theorists are, by definition, people who are not factored in. Right. And those who are then challenging that, which is why certainly from the 60s and beyond, and I'm sure before that as well, protesters and definitely when it came to civil disobedience, that people that challenged power that took to the streets, that actually challenged and fought against these policies, whether it was for civil rights, whether it was against Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera. And you can take that all the way up the decades, you know, since those are often deemed to be kind of too loud, too radical. They're not inclusive enough, even though they're pretty much the most inclusive of, you know, marginalized and vulnerable communities. Um, and yet protests are seen like, oh, well, you know, are they going to shut down traffic? Like, is my commute going to be fucked up? Because like, I think there are better ways to do that. And so what you see is the policies that are being challenged, right? The wars, the invasions, the deportations, et cetera, whatever it may be, those are never uncivil. Those are never uncouth, but challenging them in certain ways is insufficiently respectful. 